we'll be moving into our first talk, which is Bridging the Stepping Stones, Using Pieces of NixOS Without Full Commitment. So our speaker for this talk is going to be Michael Raskin. And <laughs> an interesting thing about um, Michael is you may have a hard time finding his GitHub account because it is just completely just like a random like hex dump of just random hex bytes. So I think, I believe it's like 7C6F434C. And yeah, I always have a really hard time trying to figure out, okay, what is his like GitHub again? Because it's like just random. <laughs> Okay, a little background about um, Michael is that he's one of the few people who stopped using mainline NixOS, but actually still uses Nix and Nix packages kernels at, like for more than 10 years, I believe. And he moved to NixOS from Linux from scratch, and he was actually using a separate UnionFS slice for each package in that distribution. And he's a postdoc in computer science. Um, I believe it's theoretical to apply computer science. And he started using NixOS in 2007. OK, I believe Michael cannot take it away. Hello, I'm Michael Raskin, and I will tell you about bridging the stepping stones, or how to use pieces of NixOS without full commitment to the full NixOS and without leaps of faith. So what pieces of Nix, the ecosystem you are expected to use? Well, first, Nix Package Manager. Uh, yes, you should use it. And it lives well side by side with anything. So the only cost is maybe doubling the space you needed for installing software. Next, Nix Packages Package Collection. Uh, you most likely want to use it. And what's the cost? Maybe a few gigabytes of clones lying around and standard environments build, which you would build in a slightly more space efficient way, I guess. And then there is NixOS Operating System Distribution. Well, maybe you also want to use that. After all, what's the cost? Only changing all of your habits about how to manage an operating system installation. Of course, NixOS has a lot of nice features and many of them are listed on the home page. But basically, it boils down to three bullet points. Uh, your system is Nix package and you happen to have Nix around too. If you boot up to stage two, you are very likely to boot successfully and into a consistent state. And uh, you have a declarative config, which is just a single expression uh, which gets instantiated from zero to complete and can be versioned and whatever. These are really cool features. Uh, so now you might be asking yourself, can you now finally safely experiment with all the cool stuff like init systems, operating system kernels and services which you can override to your liking? And also, can you finally escape all these complicated interactions between the things that get installed imperatively? Unfortunately, the situation is a bit more complicated. Well, first of all, NixOS uh, hard codes quite a few things. First of all, it is written around a Linux kernel and systemd as the init system. And then the configuration of NixOS, this declarative thing, is done via model system, which is nice for simple things and propagates your preferences across the configuration correctly. Uh, but when you do complicated things, you notice that there are a lot of moving parts and there is a global namespace and they sometimes touch the same place in the namespace. Of course, this gets resolved automatically, but the interaction complexity is back uh, here. And also, when you want to play with overriding services, it turns out that modules are less overridable than NixPackages packages. And of course, NixOS hard codes how you describe the core of your system, like you have to use this NixOS specific DSL to describe which file systems to mount on boot. On the one hand, it looks like not with a lot of hard coding because what distribution doesn't hard code such things. On the other hand, it turns out that inside of all this, are trapped some less opinionated things like configuration generators for multiple daemons and also start flag uh, knowledge for these daemons. 
And as an illustration that indeed there is less opinionated code that is kind of trapped inside, uh, this knowledge is duplicated in Nix Darwin, even though for a different uh, service management system, and Home Manager, which sometimes has a duplication of functionality with Nix OS with slightly different approaches in a confusing way, and of course Nix Process Management, which you will hear about later today. Of course, one can also ask, is this code really trapped? I invoke the law of headlines ending in the question mark uh, to hear the answer. Well, it is complicated. There is a strategy how to use all this code outside the mainline NixOS installation. You just evaluate NixOS as a function, as a Nix expression, with configuration which is be minimal beyond minimal. It is not enough to build a bootable NixOS or maybe even a container. It only talks about the service itself. And then you grab the parts you care about, like most likely the configuration files in the ATC, and also a nice part of NixOS System Day Union Generation functionality is possibility to export the contents of exec stuff uh, to a runnable script. Uh, thanks for that, it's really useful in many cases. Uh, by the way, I use both things I have described here in, on my own system to grab CAPS running and to get XORG configuration. Uh, so currently, uh, all of this functionality I use is online, which allows you to grab service script by service name and NixOS configuration, and also etc file or a bunch of files in etc. And all of this is online and has been online for some time. So, what are the implications and impl the limitations of these approaches? I claim that the main value of NixOS, which it would take the most time to replicate, uh, even based on Nix, is a large database of configuration generators for many, many daemons and programs. And many services are actually already reusable, which is nice if you know how to do it and you have a use case. Of course, there are some catches. You need to pay attention because, for example, many services are uh, configured not uh, just under their namespace, but all over the place. And also, some services are too complicated for a working runner script to be generated automatically by the generic code. You might be able to grab the parts of the unit and slap together the correct runner script uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. And then, of course, some services have configs that do not go to slash dc and also do not get an option name for the content. They just get reference inside the service starter uh, unit and they are annoying to grab. So uh, you see that I said that I can uh, replace the NixOS boot scripts, uh, so not to run the full NixOS, but still use the services. But I said something about the model system, and what would I use instead? I would use something mimicking Nix PKGAS overlays, so make extensible all the things and define a small core system. And then the core system adapts by reading some parameters from self, like list of services, which might be empty by default. And in overlay lays you overwrite whatever you want to reconfigure. And of course, you want to put as much as possible into this ether set and not into let instances, uh, because you want everything to be inspectable and maybe even modifiable. On the other hand, I can say that what if not the model system is the wrong question. The other question is, can we make it not matter? Uh, the question is that services could be like packages, they could be packages with parameters, and they could provide rich pass-through, and they could request and inspect other service instances. And then it's user's choice how to ensure that everything gets passed and that every service gets as a parameter correctly con configured instance of dependencies. And of course model system would be the default, would be the only thing supported by mainline XOS, but it would be easier to uh, extract it and replace it, and it would be a well-defined top-level layer with clean separation of responsibilities. 
And another thing that NixOS kind of hard codes is the good loader handling, because of course NixOS assumes that it's the only thing that could want to configure bootloader based on system generations managed by Nix. And naturally it assumes that all the layout is the NixOS layout, which uh, leads to some kind of unfortunate things, some unmodularity, like that the single Perl script generating the group entries must know what how NixOS handles Zen and stuff like that. And all of this means that if you have a different system which creates system generations, it won't probably be compatible with NixOS unless I take everything that NixOS does exactly. And that's why I'm actually too lazy to dual boot with NixOS because I would need to integrate the two uh, lines of bootloader generation. So if I dream what I would dream about, I would like to see NixOS services as Nix as like package collection with services configured by argument of passing and the argument overrides and maybe overlays. I would love to see model system then on top of that as one of the ways to connect things, even if the main one. And then uh, I would love to see m multiple independence options for core, like for boot scripts and stuff arise uh, while still sharing the service database in an efficient way. And then to make dual booting such options more convenient between each other, uh, maybe NixOS bootloader generator would collect bootloader configuration snippets from each system generation. Of course, that means that you need to provide snippets at once for all the bootloaders you theoretically support. And probably you would want to fail unless a special force flag is passed if booted system does not support the loader you are trying to configure for the new system, uh, but still it could be a step forward. And if I'm dreaming anyway, I would like NixOS to gain support for atomic slash etc switching. It's not completely infeasible. I do use it on my system, which is kind of similar uh, to NixOS, and it's a symlink into store, and so one symlink change, and that's it. I promised to talk a bit about why did I even bother replacing the NixOS boot script. Well, first of all, I like that my virtual terminals are not owned by systemd, which makes it easier to do my custom tricks around launching xorg, and also it makes it easier to write stuff like power of command is privileged, not by password, by by a check of physical pre uh, presence. Uh, sorry, no screencast, because it's very annoying to use uh, Xorg screencasting software with a lot of virtual terminal switches, you know. And then my system is managed by custom written, custom common list daemon mainly, and for example, it integrates uh, uh, automatic NSJL ropers, so everything I ca want can be run in jail, uh, because I don't know, nobody runs browsers outside containers in 2020, right? And of course, only handpicked things have sound access, which means that my user doesn't actually have sound access, only the things that are run in jails, which are specifically granted sound. And then uh, my on-boot mounts are a mess, which is for me easier to manage as a straightforward shell script than inside Nix DSL and maybe uh, contrary to its assumptions. And then just for fun and ease of debugging, I have full versions of everything I have in any TrimFS included there. So LVM2 means full LVM2, yes, with full glibc dependency. Yes, it takes space, but it only takes space in memory until I actually switch to the main system, so who cares. And I like to have my services started via explicitly specified nice traceable scripts, so if something goes wrong, it's easier to debug. And what you can take out of this, if you want commitment neither to NixOS approach nor to my approach, well, you can take wrappers for piece ex extraction out of NixOS, as I mentioned. And then a wrapper to create an isolated debug session inside a container for something that wants debug session but doesn't deserve access to your main one, if you even have the main debug session, because I don't. 
Uh, maybe you might be interested in Firefox Empty Profile Builder based on launching Firefox once in XDummy. And then there is some code for converting true type fonts to bitmap format for Linux console because monospace fonts often come with very good hinting and FontForge is pretty good at converting fonts between formats. Thanks for your attention. Are there questions? Okay, hello everyone. That was Michael Raskin um, bridging the stepping stones using pieces of NixOS without full commitment. And I did get um, news from the channel that we did start a bit earlier than expected. So I think it was supposed to start at 7.15. <laughs> so I am sorry about that. That may make um, it such that we don't have a lot of questions for um, the Q&A portion. Uh, let me look into the pad and see if we have any questions, Michael. Yeah, I do not um, actually see any questions. I will also um, manually check the channel. NixCon Q&A, if anyone has a question, you can ask there. Yeah, I do not see a question. Yeah, I am sorry about that, Michael. Yeah, it oh. happens, whatever. On the other hand, maybe it means that the talk was clear enough. Yeah, that is also um, <laughs> a possibility. So um, I would say, you could um, I will direct you to like um the breakout room, which is um bridging steps, bridging dash steps, and I'm sure that um if people um watch your um talk later or like go back into the broadcast, they can um see that and they can ask you questions from there. Oh, I think it's Puck says that two questions appeared just now. I will just read them from the uh chat, Michael. So we have one from SRHB, and she said, is abstracting the service generation worth it in Nixos proper? Maybe. Uh, Michael, I believe you're muted. I'm sorry. Uh, let me, uh, let me work for the word proper. Uh, work for it in Nixos proper, maybe. Well, I mean, I don't know exactly how much you want to say that NixOS is the default set of options. I believe that you want, uh, well, I believe it's valuable to have a service database that we can reuse and that we can work on collectively regardless of our specific choices. I don't know maybe what subset of the options should be called NixOS proper and what subsets of options should be called using the services from the NixOS database on a different system. I think that can be discussed once we have that code, once we have things to compare. I'm not sure, like, well, it's okay if NixOS is an opinionated set of choices in that regard. It's just a question of what we want to allow next to NixOS, and then we can decide what to reintegrate. OK, I, that's, that was pretty clear to me, actually. So we have a question from Nixer86, um, and they say, it was not obvious from the talk, or I missed it, but do you still use systemd? Uh, well, it turns out that I ended up not using systemd at all. And I'm not against using systemd in some container or something, but just never needed it enough. I definitely don't want to have systemd own anything on my top level namespace. And yeah, well, as I don't run it in smaller namespaces and I don't want it at the top level, I ended up without using systemd at all. Well, of course, I have everything linked against systemd libraries, but that's another story. OK, we have another question from Hyperfect. Oh, I know you. Hey. <laughs> How does the usability of the module system and your extensibility mechanism compare in practice? 
Uh, well, in a sense, it's hard to say because for my needs, uh, my, this extensibility via overlays has better transparency and easier debugability for my specific use case. But that's uh, another story in a sense. Uh, I never tried to use model system to uh, have multiple people make uh, uh, multiple people build uh, vastly different uh, configurations. And I cannot exclude for many people, it is a very good choice to use model system because it propagates your uh, preferences across the system well. Uh, well, at least as long as you are inside the expectations. Uh, so it's, uh, I don't know, I didn't try to see for who, for who I, I believe that there are uh, situations where for some people and for some settings, uh, different approaches are more usable, more debuggable, more inspectable than the model system. And as I said, I am not sure. It might be that it's still the best choice for the mainline, most popular version of NixOS. Okay, we have a question from Ryan TM. He says, it sounds like your suggestion to move modules to packages is maybe the opposite of Ilko's proposal yesterday. What do you think? Haha. <laughs> well, I think the following. Well, first of all, uh, as of me not addressing at all any of Ilko's points, uh, kind of sorry, but World of Peace can co confirm that my recording has been uh, finished before I had any chance to see uh, Elka's talk yesterday. Uh, and on the other hand, yeah, I think the following. I do believe that, well, when I looked yesterday, for example, at the slides uh, of Elka's talk, I was a bit worried. Then you say, okay, and you can overwrite the configs of the model you extend. And then you, I saw the config overwrite, and it was just global overwrite. And so, you know, it's complicated. Uh, so I felt that, okay, so what are the scoping rules? I think that for putting uh, models inside Nix, things like scoping rules, not to stop being, you know, a f purely functional programming language, which gives you an, at least an option to have full referential transparency, not only formally, but also really, and to avoid global namespaces if you want to avoid the global namespaces and so on. I think Nix being a purely functional programming language was very valuable from the very beginning and is still valuable now. And so I believe, yeah, as I said, I believe that model system is a good thing at some levels, but I believe there are layers that are better done as pure functions and fully extent and fully expectable plain uh, uh, data structures. Okay, um, looking at the pad again for more questions, I do not see any. Uh, I think. Uh, what Virik? Ah, Virik asked, uh, what's, the, what's my init? Uh, well, uh, as for my init system, well, it turns out that if you have a small, small enough desktop system and you actually want to uh, see and control what is there and how it uh, runs. Uh, it turns out that if you have just a few things and you immediately observe whether they are working or not, and you restart them for unrelated reasons anyway, like I restart my local bin when I change the network I'm connected to for just so that it reconfigures itself a, a bit. Uh, I, it turns out that in this situation, uh, I don't even need an init, a real init system in a sense. So I do have uh, PID1, obviously, and PID1 is intended as an init system, and it is static init as init from Suckless. I don't like everything Suckless does. Uh, in well, in the sense, I don't find useful for me all the tools Suckless produce. But as a need, I looked at it and it does exactly what I wanted it to do. And so, yeah, my init is as a need. 
And then I have, as I said, I have this Jumber daemon which manages my system. In particular, it launches the few daemons I want to be to have running on my system. So, and that's it, more or less. And somehow it turns out that on a simple enough system with enough RAM, and they happen to have enough RAM, you know, Cubs doesn't crash, Bint doesn't crash on its own, XORG doesn't crash on its own. And then what is even there for a true system supervisor to monitor? OK, great. Oh, we have another question. Is there something else apart from NSJL that I could check to learn more about your jail setup? It sounds like you're going to prison. <laughs> well, I mean, I as you, I, I, I hope at some point, yeah, I will at some point publish the slides, I guess, and I hope that the recording will be there. There is, well, most of my setup, because of course there are some small things which are very local, like some of the specific uh, host names and stuff, which might not be fully included, but generally, uh, you know, I have uh, most of my setup online in my GitHub account uh, as LangoS. And uh, yeah, well, you can look at this, but basically it's a lot, well, basically it's just using NSJL. And then there is a lot of things that you need to tell to NSJL to comfortably rob some application. I need to tell NSJL what directories to provide to the application, uh, what of them to provide read-only or read-write. I also run NSJL under a specific, sub, a specific user ID, which is unique for every application during a single session and stuff like that. And I set the environment variables, of course, because of course you need to set up stuff. But basically, well, it's a piece of code to generate a ton of uh, flags to NSJL, I would say. OK, great answer, actually. Um, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A portion, so I believe that would lead us into the cl closing. Thank you so much for being here, Michael. It seems that um, you get to have a very, um, basically an extended Q&A portion because we started early. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yep, nice having you. And if everyone wants to follow in on more questions for Michael, we will be forcing him into the Bridging-Steps Jitsi room where you can continue discussion and stuff like that. OK, and because we started early, I do have a brief, brief announcement that the break will be longer because of that. And the next talk starts at the 45 minute mark on the hour. And I will see all of you then. And please remember to put those, you know, put those claps into the um, NixCon channel. Show the love. I'm watching you. Bye. See you soon.